Hi, this is Lolita Ritmanis, composer for Young Justice, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized Uncle Walker D zero one. Recognized Emily of Arden D one two. Hello, team. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for episode two of Whelm season three. My name is Rich, and with me is my co-host Emily. Hey, everybody! In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, Easter eggs, and comic book history of Young Justice, and use that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we will be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. On the Engager, if Clamulons capture our crewmates, we move heaven and earth to find them. This year alone, over 16,000 child and teen abductions have been reported worldwide due to the illegal trafficking of metahumans. Please, watch over your children. And if you see something, scream something. And with all that, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! Our title for this week's episode is Royal We. The release date was January 4th of 2019. The in-episode date was just July 30th, and the writer was Andrew Robinson, along with director Mel Zwire and voice director Jamie Thomason. Special guest voice credits. So in addition to our returning team, uh, cast from season one and two, we have a lot of new characters returning, supporting cast characters and actors. Troy Baker, uh, not only does he voice Brion in this episode, he also voices Simon X, which means that he argues with himself a lot in this one. Uh, Steve Bloom uh, returns as Count Vertigo and as Henchy, once again, arguing with himself. It's, it's a thing. I don't know what the deal is. Greg Sipes uh, makes his appearance. The former voice uh, actor of Beast Boy in The Titans is back for Young Justice's own Garfield Logan. Uh, <laughs> Zara, sorry, Sarah Fuzzle is dead girl. That's going to be like, I don't know. Sounds like it needs to be a sidekick to dead man. Gray Griffin does the voice of Helga Jace and does the voice of Troya in this episode. Yuri Lowenthal, um, best known as the voice of Emily's favorite supporting cast character from season two. Don't even joke about it, Rich. <laughs> if you say it, people will believe you. Voices Garth and Zviad Bazovi, and we'll talk about him in a little bit. Uh, Nolan North does Connor and Baron Frederick DeLam, and Mark Rolston returns as Lex Luthor and also does the voice. Uh, this is the first time we've heard the voice of uh, Suman Harjavti, right? I I think so. I think was he he was only in the comics, right? His brother was in season one, and he's in the tie-in comics. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the so comics. now we have he did, yeah, tie-in comics, and just do the voice like Mark Rolston does it in your head. Uh, and with all that, let's get on to the mission briefing. Just in time for your next mission. We open this episode with a public service announcement from science fiction actor Garfield Logan, a.k.a. Beast Boy. We then cut to a United Nations meeting where the resignation of Batman, Black Lightning, and other members of the League is announced. Atlantean Ambassador Garth and Themyscirian Ambassador Troya voice their continued opposition to the restrictions placed on the League by the UN Charter. Ambassadors from both Relasia and Bialia voice their frustrations with the League. And finally, the ambassador from Markovia states that any unauthorized vigilante activity in Markovia will be declared illegal. His voiceover highlights Dick and Artemis entering Markovia using fake passports to, you know, do unauthorized vigilante activity in Markovia. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we cut to a flashback of Dick reviewing the plan. Black Lightning and Superboy are to enter Markovia with their gear using the supercycle, while Dick and Artemis crash the party, where it is officially announced that Gregor, the crown prince of Markovia, will be crowned king the next day, and his uncle, Frederick de Lamb, will be made regent until Gregor becomes 18. During that party, we learn that Gregor's younger brother, Brion, has decided to activate his metagene with the help of family physician, Dr. Jace, and metagene expert, Dr. Simon X. 
Dick follows Dr. X and Brion while Artemis picks up their gear that Connor and Left dropped off before investigating the children's hospital at which Dr. X works. At the hospital, Connor and Jeff break in to find a secret research facility as well as a disassembled, also known as murdered, mother box. Before they can free several children being held there, they are interrupted by Count Vertigo and a metahuman he calls Plasmus, who bears a striking resemblance to the metahuman Jeff accidentally killed on Ran. We then cut to the cemetery where Artemis is retrieving their gear, and we see three henchmen burying dead teenagers in a mass grave. Yep. Uh, (laughs) By Cartoon Network. After a flash of violet light, one of the teenagers wakes up and tries to escape. Artemis intervenes when the henchmen try to kill the girl again, and she rescues her. Uh, Meanwhile, back at the hospital, Connor and Jeff escape by ripping through the floor of the facility, but Plasmus manages to capture Connor just after Jeff escapes out of a sewer outlet. We cut to Dick following Dr. X and Brion as they get to the children's hospital, and Dick sends a beetle-shaped bug after them. Artemis reroutes to Jeff's position, but finds him barely conscious on the beach. Plasmus then drags Superboy back to Count Vertigo, who puts him in another containment pod. <laughs> <laughs> always always the highlight of Superboy's day. <laughs> Dr. X reveals the metahuman program to Prince Brion, who is horrified to realize that Dr. X isn't simply familiar with metagene activation. He is one of the head doctors for the trafficking ring his parents were actively fighting against. Dick, Jeff, and Artemis converge on the secret facility just as we find out that Dr. Jace is actually working for Project Bedlam, and she starts the metagene activation process on Brion. We end the episode with Count Vertigo calling someone he refers to as Your Highness to inform them their operation may have been compromised, followed by Brion waking up in a pod as it fills with the substance called tar. He screams for help as Dr. J smiles at him and tells him it's all for the best. <laughs> That's sure one way to end an episode. <laughs> oh, oof. And these are like warm-up episodes for the rest of the season. I tell you. No spoilers. Right. No spoilers. Let's feel that aster. Dipper boy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. You want me to start? Please dive in. Okay. So starting from the top on this one, I really do like Beast Boy, like, using his platform for good. Like, he's not a superhero anymore, but he's still going out of his way to be like, I have some say in the world. Let me do something about it. It's nice. Yeah. And it gives us some cool world building. We assume he's not a superhero at this point. We assume that he's just kind of living his life. Yeah. Because we haven't seen him around with the team or anything. Right. Exactly. He's definitely not with the team. And neither neither is um, Troya and Garth, apparently. And we (laughs) know they were with the team. Yes. Everybody's just living their best life. Yeah, they were being part of the team during that during that five year time skip. <laughs> right. <laughs> Speaking of that UN scene, I noticed on my whatever millionth rewatch I did <laughs> for this review episode that when that when they say that some members of the league have resigned from the league and that they're revealing this to the to like the public. Nobody reacts until she says Batman, and then everyone gasps. <laughs> right. It's like, oh, it's probably some low-level members of the league. Yeah. Like, uh, oh, Plastic Man, Batman. whatever. But the second she's like, Batman, everyone's like, oh, no. Oh, this oh, is legit. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. A nice, it's a nice well, little touch. It is. I mean, he is a founding member. It's not yes. like you know, Hardware or <laughs> Plastic Man. I don't know. Like, people that watchers don't know that well, but yeah. And as we were saying... Garth and Garth and Donna Troy. You want you want to shout about them for a bit? Yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited. We talked about these in the Scream Something episodes, but of course, uh, the uh, Atlantean ambassador is Garth, aka Tempest. Not only was he in the downtime episode of uh, Young Justice in season one, he is also in the tie-in comics and the video game and the video game as well. So we know that he, uh, along with Tula. His long-term girlfriend and the woman that our Aqualad, now Aquaman. Calder. <laughs> Calder wanted to uh, <laughs> wanted to be name. in a relationship. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, that he wanted to be in a relationship with, but, you know, 
we find out specifically in the tie in comics that he's bummed, but he's like, Hey, it's, it's, it's on me. I never told her that I, <laughs> that I had a thing for her officially. So I can be sad, but I, I get to take responsibility for my actions. I love that business. Yeah. So show, seeing him as the Atlantean ambassador, but then they cut, then they cut to the Themyscira ambassador and it's Troya, yes. uh, aka Donna Troy. Uh, the first Wonder Girl uh, in the comics, who was Wonder Woman's first uh, sidekick. Yeah, and the first the first Wonder Girl in uh, YJ continuity. We just didn't see her because she happened during the five year gap. Right. Greg yeah, Wiseman exactly. has talked about that stuff where when people are like, "Why'd you skip straight to Cassie instead of having Donna join the team?" He's like, "No, Donna joined the team and left the team over the right. course of five years." What's interesting is, I mean, I'm assuming she was called Wonder Girl at the time, but if you look at the um, the designations that you can find on the YJ wiki, she her, she's listed as Troya. Oh, uh, oh. And so, but I mean, you know, Speedy's listed as Red Arrow. So, I mean, as she grew up and changed her name to something more personal, they probably just updated it. I'd love to see some flashbacks of her being on the team. That would be fantastic. Oh, that would be so much fun. But the idea that... So Harjafti, who is the ambassador from Bialya, not Kurak, Greater Bialya, which is a whole thing. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. I'll get into that a little bit in a minute, but I don't want to derail right at the moment. So he says, oh, you're just, you know, I'm not surprised by your reaction seeing that the the League is led by a Themyscaran and an Atlantean. Which mean he didn't say, oh, I, I get your reaction because you used to be part of the covert ops team. Like, yeah. you used to be part of the league. So, neither one of them joined the league. They were both members of the of the team. So, that means that their activity as actual active superheroes is still covert, still yeah. not public knowledge. I feel like, judging by the way YJ handles politics, I feel like it would genuinely feel like a conflict of interests if they let anyone who was or is on the League be part of the UN. Like, yeah. cause in the past, Wonder Woman has been part of the UN in previous comic incarnations. And I feel yeah. like in YJ, they wouldn't let her. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. <laughs> I did notice that Garth's outfit didn't change very much, though. <laughs> Not sure what was up with that. You think it would an be a little bit, and he kept it. <laughs> That's right. When you find what works for <laughs> you, right. you stay with it. <laughs> right, Garth's that kind of guy. If I it can ain't see broke, that. don't fix it. <laughs> right. I, I loved how um, Harjafti gets all bent out of shape because there's no Karaki heroes, no Karaki metahuman or super. I can't remember what he says actually. Yeah, has been invited to join the League and choices. <laughs> well, when you produce one who's not an not a wanted criminal, maybe we'll. <laughs> maybe they'll consider it yeah oh and part of what i love with that line hearing it for like the millionth time that i've watched this episode what she says is she's like maybe the league will consider her or his candidacy for the league of course that's the linguistic structure of that phrase for someone from an all-female culture yes like, that was just such a nice little touch that i'm like oh because when you hear it the first time you're like that's not what people say and then you're like Oh, of course, that's what they say on that mascara. That makes right. perfect sense. <laughs> right. And his response saying, that's a gross exaggeration. He doesn't counter her point. He just says, that's a gross exaggeration. And her response is. <laughs> which means it is which, largely which, true. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's so good. She's just so done. She's like, I'm, Have not, a seat. I'm not putting I'm up done. with this. I'm not. I'm not. Block. Block button. I'm <laughs> done with you. <laughs> what is up with you? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and so of course I want to see I want to see much more of them, and I want to see more of Troya. I agree. Um, but that whole UN scene is chocked full of crazy Easter eggs and <laughs> potential future stuff. We're going to talk about some of that in Crashing the Mode. And Luther, <laughs> he's been doing this for assuming he didn't he wasn't immediately placed in as the head of UN, and they had some kind of election at some point. I mean, he's still been there for a year or two. I don't know how long a UN chairman <laughs> serves. Like, didn't, but didn't at the very end of season two, they had the scene right after, after the whole Beatle situation where they're like, and now Lex Luthor is the head of the UN. No, uh, I think, I don't think so. What I, th I'd have to go back and rewatch it, but I think what happened was, is G Gordon announced that, that the former, the former Secretary head, Zhang. 
Zhang, thank you, Secretary Zhang had stepped down. And he said, we, and G. Gordon was like, we all know who needs to be the man to step into that place. It's oh, got to okay. be Lex Luthor, the man who saved the world. But I don't think he was, I, if I remember correctly, I don't think he was announcing that Lex was taking his place. Immediately he was just. Immediately elect Lex Luthor. Save the planet <laughs> right. immediately. Put Lex Luthor right. in the UN. That's how this works, right? <laughs> that's always, that's always worked that's out. The, that's the turnaround <laughs> that right. quickly. Yeah. But speaking of a different politician in the DC universe, I love that they include Queen Perdita at this coronation party. Like she's yeah. in the background. It's real quick. She her name yeah. is never mentioned, but like that's what Queen Perdita looks like. It's definitely her. It's definitely her. And we see next episode we get a clear scene of what she looks like a little bit older from, you know, where we saw her in yeah. season 1. But that's definitely definitely her. Definitely I agree. Her. And it's yeah. such, it's just a nice little choice. It's one of those things where you're like you didn't have to do that, but it gives the world continuity. And I like it. So there are some really great moments in this episode in particular, but kind of this whole season. We were talking about it a bit in the last episode where Connor has like these really grounded, emotionally soft moments where he's acting really grounded. And it's kind of the inverse of toxic masculinity in a lot of ways where yeah. Connor like he has his care and affection towards Super Cycle, which is always adorable. But like he al he also emotionally checks in with Jeff before they go into the morgue, where he's just like, "Are you okay? Is this something you can do right now?" Yeah. And like even once they're in there, he keeps his rage under control. Once he like he has that emotional trauma that comes up about Cadmus, and he's just like, "No, no, we're keeping this together. It's fine." <laughs> right. And even like his reaction to the mother box, where it's like they're in the middle of a mission, and he still takes this moment to be like, "No, this is emotionally affecting me. Give me a second. And it's real <laughs> I, good. I do like when Jeff saw. Did you just growl? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, "Yes, I allowed myself to do that." <laughs> but and like, not you in a compare fun way. that. You compare that to like season one, where it's like, this is like Cadmus, time to break, <laughs> destroy everything. <laughs> right. Like Connor right. has himself under control. Connor knows himself. Connor is in touch with his emotions and it makes me happy. Never thought I'd say that about <laughs> Superboy, but you know, right. it's good. It's gross. <laughs> also, he can punch through a floor. <laughs> <laughs> but when necessary. Right. Yeah. And he loses his shirt a lot in this episode as well. Which is, you mean yeah. this season? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's crashing the mode, I think. <laughs> crashing the shirt. Yeah. <laughs> so moving on from that, <laughs> we also, Jefferson has his flashbacks this this episode as part of this yeah. episode. Flashbacks to what happened on RAN. And it feels like they're clearly written in and intended to be reminders of past events for watching this on a week-to-week -week release schedule, because I think that may have initially been how they kind of wrote and constructed these episodes, thinking that would be what happened, and then yeah. it didn't. We don't know for sure, but it kind of feels like that. But having them formatted as, like, trauma flashbacks makes it this emotional moment rather than just, here's exposition you need to remember. And I really yeah. like it. Like, it really works for me as a viewer, even watching this, where I'm like, yeah, no, I watched that 10 minutes ago. I know what happened. What, why are you showing right. me this again? Right. It doesn't feel like that. It's like, okay, yes, no, this is an emotional ride I'm going on here. Yeah, I think we're going to talk about that a little bit in the Canary Debrief as well. Yeah, yeah. About the use of, the use of flashbacks and how they can be best used and <laughs> can sometimes be badly used. <laughs> but yeah, I, I agree with you on that as well. Um, and also we talked about the fact that this storyline, this idea of Jeff losing his powers is a thing that happened in the Outsiders comic. Like that's that's what happened as one of the many converging storylines that led to the Outsiders being created back in the day, which I just think is I just think is brilliant. It is. They weave everything together so well. And last last note for me on this, because we were talking about the UN before, and the UN comes up again later in this episode, where after uh, Count Vertigo takes off Superboy's mask, uh, he says, ah, oh, the Superboy, I believe the UN, the United Nations, would find your presence here quite interesting. And I have so many questions about this line, and I have since our Scream Something episode, and none of them have been answered, and I am just <laughs> screaming forever. Because this line implies that the United Nations may not know about, like, the covert ops team 
but they may know about Superboy. Right. Because, like, this line implies that the UN would care that Superboy is breaking the UN charter. Right. Okay. Well, what does that mean? That's a lot to unpack right there. And- which also which also makes me... I just thought about this right now. I mean, Lex heads the freaking UN. <laughs> he knows the team exists. So, what? You know, like, I mean, the reason Batman sent them into Bialya in the first place was because of the, yeah, the Back UN Charter one? stopping the league. Does that mean that the... Though when you said, the second you said Lex Luthor is in charge of the UN, my first thought was, so did he have take your kid to work day and just kind of introduced Superboy to everyone? It's like, this is my clone son. Ouch. Too soon. <laughs> it's too soon. Rich, it's been, it's been what, seven years? <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, but it does give some implications. So what happens? What, what happens with Lex? What if, the, what if Lex finds out through the light that the team has been active in a country they're not supposed to be active in? Does Lex out the fact that the team exists? Or does he like, well, I don't know if I, I mean, if I, if I admit that the team exists, then I have to admit why I know that. And that's a problem. <laughs> So like maybe it's like, keeping do you it. want to go down that rabbit hole, Lex? <laughs> right, exactly. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder interesting. how that's going to pan it's out. Worrying. We'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> it's all worrying. <laughs> it's young justice. Everything makes us worried. <laughs> right. Right. But what do you got, Rich? What do you got to share about this episode? Oh, you well, we talked about a few things before, but I'm going to want to revisit them here. So we've got the spiral tech, right? So Jeff, Jeff and Connor put these, um, put these cameras up. And when they, they take the time to do this quick little video shot from the perspective of the camera, and you see that Jeff and Connor's faces are spiraled out, which is uh, technology from a secret agent organization called Spiral in the DC Universe an organization that Dick Grayson worked for when he left temporarily being Nightwing and became an, a basically a super agent um, for a couple of years, which makes me think, did Dick bring this technology back? I mean, he was saying like, okay, I'll, I'll bring you some darkware. I'll make darkware available to you. Well, clearly these masks are part of that, whatever that darkware thing is that he's talking about. So do the masks do this thing where it spirals out? And you pointed something out to me this morning. I didn't catch. That's next episode. Oh, stay tuned for next episode. <laughs> Cuz Emily pointed out something in the background. I got to go watch again. But yeah, so if he's is in this 2-year break, Dick said I got to take a break. Maybe he's meant I got to take a break being Nightwing and went to go work with this secret agent organization to use the skills to do something else. I don't know how that's going to get tied into anything, which is pretty crazy. So, and then there's the tar, right? Yeah. The tar, which came up in the previous episode as well, but we see see it painfully uh, <laughs> being utilized a lot. They call it tar. The there is a there is a drug in the DC universe called tar that was used in the Steel comics. It was a street drug that was kind of like super PCP, like it enhanced strength, <laughs> increased durability, magnified people's aggression. There was also a version eventually that, you know, because you got up the Jeopardy, there had to be a a more dangerous version where like, I think he used it like three times or four times or something like that. And it would just kill you (laughs) after the third or fourth time. I don't know if they're making a nod to that, but there is a tar in the DC history. So I find it interesting that they at least use that same name. One thing I noticed when I was doing this rewatch, the subtitles still aren't fixed. The subtitles are off. And we mentioned this during the Scream something. We know now that the company is knows about it and is working on it so that's great but i don't know how long it takes for them to get these things back into a queue to fix it but there's a lot of problems like sphere is referred to as seer and um sb like uh dick says sb for superboy a couple times but he goes back and forth between sp and sb jeff says my powers haven't worked since i was in iran (laughs) not ran the planet but the country of Iran. I know with with some later episodes, they seemed to be good, but mm. it may just be because these were released before some people started pointing out that, hey, 
the subtitles aren't great. So it may be that some of the later episodes got to have them fixed before they came out, whereas these need to be Maybe. refixed. Yeah, that's possible. So, but we do know that they're under uh, they're under advisement that that they need to be fixed. So we'll see how long that takes. Maybe it'll be fixed before this episode even comes out. We don't know. Oh yeah, that's possible too. That would be real awesome. I still so I I still don't get how Jeff got onto the beach. So tides, magic. No, I get it. Superhero. <laughs> Maybe it's because I'm so focused on aquatic, like, storytelling. No, I know. I know. It's a real cliche thing to have, like, a shipwreck and everybody washed up on the beach. I mean, it's convenient, but if you're face down in the water more than about two minutes, which is much longer than it takes to get washed up on a beach somewhere, <laughs> you're you're dead. So, like, <laughs> and then they have him hit his back so hard. It's just, oof. Oh, it's rough. It's a and lot. It's a lot. And it just seems, and they cut to him being underwater and then being up on this beach. And whenever they cut and have time jumps like that, it always makes me wonder, what did you guys do? What did you do when we were looking? So my, I don't know. My theory is mermaids, but. There are mermaids. Oh, <laughs> can, can we get Laura Lemuris to show up? Laura Lemuris? That'd be great. Oh, main, main character in season four. <laughs> Yuri Lowenthal's doing voices, so maybe we'll get Lagan back. Are you excited? You're so excited. Look at that. So face. moving on to our next point. <laughs> uh um Neil pointed out a few <laughs> things too, of course. So this Space Trek thirty sixteen, of course, sixteen, and him talking about sixteen thousand abductions. Sixteen's <laughs> everywhere. And the There's uh, only one number in the in the, <laughs> in the DC universe. universe. Uh, when they come in through the gate when Artemis and Dick come through the airplane gate. They're coming through gate 16 as well. Yep. Which is pretty great. <laughs> wow. So this is also the first time that we get, this is the first time that we get a clear view that Oracle only shows up in Dick's HUD. So in the last one, when Oracle was talking to Dick, it was just the two, he was the only one on the mission. Yeah. But this episode, it's clear. She's only in Dick's HUD and she's only talking to Dick. Because when Artemis says something like, uh, maybe he just likes kids, at the same time, Oracle is talking to Dick and saying, like, I think this is our guy. And so he reacts to Oracle and says, I think you're right. And then it's like a whole joke back and forth of, you know, miscommunication. Artemis is like, what? what? Wait, what? I was um, joking. <laughs> right. And Dick has Why? to panic and be like, yeah, no, I just meant, you know. Right. And uh, then he covers it up. Yeah. Like... I don't it's know why like, they're hiding Oracle. We don't I know. I mean, they're purposefully, he is purposefully hiding her. Not like, oh, she just talks to me and I'll, I'll refer the information to everybody. Or like, I'm just kind of got, I got, I get some extra data and I don't want you guys to know my secret. I, I don't know, but he's like purposefully covering it up, which is so, still so weird to me. Like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it has something to do with how she became Oracle. Maybe it's a little different story than the Killing Joke comic. I don't know. I'm I'm really I'm really I don't looking. know. I don't know. <laughs> we have yeah. no insight. We wanna know. Second yeah. half of season three can't get here fast enough. I no. need to know why Oracle is a secret. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Neil makes some points. So usually when they have voice act vo names of characters in the credits, they're typically someone, but there's three names? So the three henchmen that are with Henchy and burying the bodies. There's Piotr Plotz and Johan Mintz. I don't know who those guys are supposed to be. And Wilhelm Peters, uh, which is a body who's a bodyguard. Like Brion's there's bodyguard. Yeah, Brion's bodyguard. So it's like, okay, so they were they it wasn't just bodyguard one or something like that. They this guy's got a name for some reason. We couldn't find anything, and that just makes me nervous. Like there's probably something that they're pulling from somewhere that we could not find any information on. So if you know who these people are, let us know. Neil and went digging and he's like, I can't find anything and I can't handle it. <laughs> I did too. We both went digging and neither way, both of us came out with nothing. I went down some some rabbit hole of of Lithuanian. I ended up in t reading a <laughs> Wikipedia article about the Lithuanian 
Congress or something like that. It was well, just you like you learned something new. I did. I learned something new for sure. The you know more about the Lithuanian Congress than you did before. Oh, I'm gonna pronounce and it wrong. I think it's called is like its own reward. <laughs> I think it's called the gem or something like that. I don't know. I was like, what is this? And then, and, but it, then it would, I was like, oh, this is somehow I ended up in the Lithuanian Congress. And there was a whole thing about, God, is it, it what, Markovian, the Markovian language is Latvian? There's oh, a whole li- thing. Uh, they saw, uh, <laughs> I saw this and I got very excited because I am part Latvian. Uh, it's, based on it a little bit but mostly i think they were talking about how it's in that general area and all of those languages have a lot of overlap in real life so it's yeah. not exactly latvian right but it draws on latvian right we actually i've seen that video interview too <laughs> <laughs> so i was like wait does this have something to do with something i don't i ended up in this hole and i don't think it has anything to do with anything uh anyway we don't know who these people people are because they don't even name like zara's playing dead girl like they don't even like give it's a secret rich i know secrets big secret oh oh where is secret please (laughs) i want her i want secret back let her join the team yeah let us have this weird ghost girl (laughs) weird ghost girl please (laughs) (laughs) and then of course henchy uh, voiced by Steve Bloom, who was voiced by Steve Bloom in the Green Arrow showcase short. <laughs> if you haven't seen that one, it was actually pretty good. It's exact same character design. It's just yep. weird. Yeah, he's just generic henchman guy for everyone. He was that also same short. Also has Queen Perdita in it. It does. It has Queen Perdita in it. That's right. And Henchy's first appearance in Young Justice was as the the quote unquote, like the doctor or whatever who takes the heart from Kid Flash. Yep. In uh, in Cold Hearted as well. So, yeah. Anyway, those are a few of the th- those are the few of the things that we have. I can't, I'm trying to think if there's anything more. Oh, yeah. Neil made a comment about it's hard to feel the aster when both your parents have been murdered. Trust me. Like Dick. That's <laughs> a oof. Nice Dick. Wow. Ouch. Like you didn't you didn't need to go there, but also the fact that Artemis doesn't really respond almost feels like maybe maybe Dick says stuff like that. Kind of maybe a little too much, and everyone's gotten used to it. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. This is how he copes. Yeah. Well, it's not like she doesn't know. Like, yeah. She clearly, she's got to know. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. Yep. It's crazy. They, di- they didn't turn it into like an emotional character moment. It's just an offhand like, oh, <laughs> you okay there, Dick Grayson? <laughs> oh, alrighty. Let's do that. <laughs> And that's about that's about it. That's all the aster we've got, and all the sixteens Neil was able to find so far. Anyway, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Um, we're gonna uh, take a break, roll into the mid roll, and then when we come back, we'll do our canary debrief and fan service, and then finish up with some crash in the mode. Let's do it. Ah, yeah. Uh, welcome to the fake your own death club. Its membership is very exclusive, and I'm the president. Hello, team, and welcome to the mid roll. This week, we want to thank our newest Patreon backers: Jay, Kylie, Baggage Goal. Alyssa Meager, and Stephanie Brown. That's right. We're official. Stephanie Brown now backs us on Patreon. Thank you to all of our Patreon backers. It's been a while since we've had an Intel update, so we also want to take a moment to thank those who have left reviews for us. Huge thank you to Bulldog Singleton, Cam Shafted, G Gunders, Arhawk68, Kylie28, Jason Todd, Menace1978, JSARS776260, KitKat706, and Daniel Watercaster. Five-star ratings are a huge way to help us and very simple to do. But a rating with a review, even more so. Reviews don't even need to take very long. Daniel Watercaster says, it's good. If you love Young Justice and the DC Universe in general, this is the podcast for you. Thanks, Daniel. Or you can tell potential listeners more about your experience, like from Bulldog Singleton, who wrote... I've listened to a lot of podcasts, and I've deeply appreciated many of them, but The YJ Files is the first one that moved me to write a review. They've taught me so much about the art of storytelling through their love and appreciation of Young Justice that I have actually begun appreciating well-written stories outside of the comic genre even more. Their knowledge of the DC Universe and their honesty about momentary holes in such knowledge and their giving credit to the sources that help fill them has given my family and I more purpose in discovering and appreciating comics universe history ourselves. 
And I'm not going to lie. I will often listen to a cast, rewatch an episode with my kids, and then drop a bit of knowledge that I learned <laughs> so my kids think for a moment that I'm a genius. <laughs> now, however, they're wise to the trick and we just enjoy the show that has become even more enhanced by what the YJ Files has taught us. Huge thanks, Bulldog. And uh, I have kids, man. I don't mind. <laughs> drop that knowledge. You take credit. I'm, I'm happy with that. So thanks to everyone who has left us a rating, our writtenness, a review. If you write us a five-star review, as always, please let us know, and we may share your kind words on the air in the mid-roll. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the show. Stick around. Class is in session. Some Canary Debrief. So in Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing things that we can learn about the creative process from the episodes that, that we review. And I, we wanted to dive a little bit deeper into this thing about Jeff's flashbacks, because... There's a thing that happens. It, it, we talked about it in season two. Sometimes Dick reiterating things that happened in the in the previous series felt a little bit more for the watcher than it was made sense inside the story itself, which is tough. And anytime you read a book or do an audio, like an uh, um, like a movie or something, and someone or a radio play, and someone's like, "Well, as you know, because you were there." Let me tell you all the things you know because you were there. Um, kind As of a you thing. know, is the worst <laughs> line in anything. If you can avoid it, <laughs> please, please do. Try, try to avoid it. But in in this, in season three, when we're doing these these flashbacks, it's it's this thing that I talk about about scenes having to do more than one thing, right? If if it's just narrative talking and isn't really moving the plot forward or doing any other kind of character development or anything else, then it's just doing one job. And scenes can do more than one. And if you can do more than one job in a scene, then your scene's getting tighter and tighter and moving things forward faster. And, and in this case, Jeff's flashbacks do more than one thing. Of course, they're reminding us about things that happened before uh, in the previous episodes, but they're also, <laughs> I was telling Emily, <laughs> they, they take us on that same emotional train wreck <laughs> That Jeff is on, where he's he's having all of these feelings in this moment, and we're also getting to see these quick flashes to remind us about things that had happened in previous episodes, without having to have a previously on or some kind of long narrative run. So, when you're reading a really good uh, novel series, a lot of times these things will be folded into the narrative of what's happening. So, if you're reading a a series like you know, something that's something that's long, something like Harry Potter that's got like seven books in a series, right? You need to be reminded sometimes about a few of the things that have happened in the past, but without having to list that narrative right at the beginning so that somebody has to read through like basically a thing that they had just read. Instead, they fold it into whatever it happens to be, Harry having some some feelings or emotions or something that's pushing the current plot forward while also reflecting back on his, you know, judgments or lessons he learned or whatever it happens to be in a previous book. And I think it's really important to do that in animation and in TV shows. So again, anytime that you have a scene where you've got something going on, where particularly when someone's talking, or if you feel like you need to give a, a reminder to the reader about something in the past, give it a few drafts and see if you can fold it into the actions that are still moving things forward so that person, the person who's reading your book or even playing your game, right? Or whatever it happens to be is it doesn't have to stop and take a break from the, and the momentum of the story and then get dragged back by the inertia of this flashback to keep things moving forward. And I think a lot of that gets tied up in a character's emotional response to information a lot of the time, whether it's things like Jeff's emotional flashbacks or if it's a character trying to like emotionally process information by having a conversation with someone. Those things that add a level of like, this is how these facts about our universe affect the emotions of our character makes it feel like, oh, I'm getting something more out of this rehashing of what I already may know about the narrative right. kind of thing. Another kind of good example of that is the kind of a parallel example is in season two when Superboy and Alana are in the cave and yeah. he, we're getting caught up on something that happened during the five-year jump that we want answers to. Everything in that scene makes sense. Yeah. And and works together with giving us answers, giving us a lot more questions, <laughs> developing character for Superboy and pushing the the plot forward while two people are simply sitting in a cave. 
right? Yeah. Try and get those things to wrap together and, and work in, in, in one scene if you possibly can. Uh, and with that, let's let's jump into some fan service. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creations that celebrate DC, Young Justice, and any kind of other creative works that we think Young Justice fans will love. And Emily has some fan service for us again this week. I do. I do. Uh, I have a fantastic paper artist from Tumblr who goes by DocGold13 on Tumblr. Uh, that I initially saw when Zara Fuzzle shared it on Twitter with some of her characters because this artist, they do these complex layered paper art. Like, I'm trying to think of the the right word. It's not like collages exactly, but they're these gorgeous layered fan arts that are of different characters from comics, cartoons, a bunch of different stuff, including a bunch of members of the YJ team and background characters and bunch of other people it's really cool you can check it out on tumblr we'll have the link down in the show notes or you can pop over to twitter if you want to see which ones uh zara fuzzle shared over on her twitter i haven't seen these yet i got a link over there and check that out they're very cool that's awesome and that's it for this week's fan service let's uh let's crash some mode tell us something we don't know yet sorry bb we can't risk altering the time stream we do that we're all feeling the mode our earlier segments assume that listeners have seen only up to the this episode in Season 3, which would be Episode 2. In Crash in the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that might affect what we see later on in, in a significant way. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on <laughs> wild flights of fancy um, <laughs> or things that listeners send to us, Morgan, um, <laughs> that break our hearts and make us cry. Uh, these spoilers will be based on only the first 13 episodes, as that's all we have seen at the time of this recording. And if you're a spoiler wary, of course, this is your warning. Feel free to bow out and join us next week. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Um, so. You want to talk about, <laughs> you want to talk about Dead Girl for a minute? <laughs> yeah, dead girl. That totally unimportant dead girl who totally doesn't show up for the rest of the season and have her See, own arc I, and all of her now own Now I secrets. need a dead girl, dead man <laughs> comic thing. Give everyone a sidekick. Uh, but yeah, that, that dead girl uh, is actually Halo, who we will meet next episode, basically. <laughs> next episode, she gets her name and starts having powers and everything. Uh, who we will then later find out is actually that mother box that Connor was being being all sad about. Yeah. And that her little connection with Sphere in this episode, that little right. moment where she just kind of pats Super Cycle and Artemis is like, good to see you two getting along. It's because they're from the same planet. <laughs> uh, and that moment where she like glows purple from the sky is actually one of her many powers. And it's her healing power. You know, the same one that corresponds with Sphere's healing power. There's a lot... She's Halo. She's a sentient living computer and the embodiment of light and goodness. And she's here. Yeah. She's and that we didn't box. put these puzzle pieces together the first time. No. Through. I did know that she was an alien, an alien energy being. And that's why I thought she was connecting to Sphere just from that. But I should have known they would have tightened that even farther down. That's crazy we're like oh that that moment between superboy and, and the mother box it's a good little emotional moment 10 episodes later oh it served the plot <laughs> purpose too i'm shocked <laughs> uh um well i i want to talk about a few of these characters in this un scene go for it so we we kind of gave a nod to this here suman harjafti is the ambassador from greater bialya so Sum suman harjafti was the brother of the former President Harjafti, who was the president of Karak in season one of Young Justice. Uh, he, we saw him in Image. So he's the brother of the president. And if you, in the comics, you'll see that he became kind of a, a public hero when he got shot trying to pr protect his brother, theoretically, from being assassinated. Or was his bro it was his brother? Yeah, his brother from being assassinated, right? Yes. And then... That which was Queen Bee's plan the whole time because she has Suman Harjafti under her thrall and apparently has been. And all the stuff that she was doing in season one to try to get 
Kurak and Bialya to merge into one country apparently worked because now it's yep. Greater Bialya. Yep. Uh, and in a later plans episode... Plans within plans within plans. Yeah. And in a later episode... Is this in the comic? The the comic too. There what? was some comment made where somebody says, "Oh yeah, when you went to when you went to Greater Bialya, when you guys moved to Greater Bialya, and that's in the show. Gar- that's in a later episode with Gar. It's in Nightmare Monkeys. It's in Nightmare Monkeys, and and Gar's like Karak, not <laughs> not Greater Bialya, right? So like yeah, subject. Okay, right, right. And on that same kind of that same kind of front there's Kaizen Gomora. Kaizen Gomora is a is the ambassador to from Greater Relasia. And of course there was a North and South Relasia, which was in the episode Targets that Lex Luthor was brokering a peace deal between well, apparently that peace deal went really well because now it's Greater Relasia. Kaizen Gomora is a character from Wildstorm, the Wildstorm comics that were if I remember correctly, we're former image and we're bought by DC. Uh, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But um, Kaizen Gamora was like a major supervillain. He was an international terrorist and used like super powered clones and a bunch of other stuff in his schemes. <laughs> Neil made a joke here. <laughs> he said that Greater Relasia is destined to be renamed Gamora because in the comics, Kaizen Gamora and his two brothers took over their island country uh, and changed the name once they like murdered all the people who were ruling it and took over for themselves. They changed the name of the country to Gamora. So anyway, we're going to see what that ends up being. Zviad Bazovi, who's, uh, who's the ambassador to Markovia in the comics was a KGB Soviet plant, I think, <laughs> in Markovia. Anyway, uh, Neil found out, I didn't know this. Neil found out he, he's, he's referred to as the bad Samaritan. Um, and he's in some of the Outsiders comics as well, of course, being an agent in Markovia. But he's often doing a lot of political intrigue and espionage, and t- which is exactly what he's doing in these episodes. You'll We see him return in this kind of supporting cast role in the background. So we'll see. We have I have more to say about him in the next little bit. Excuse me, in the next episode as well. So, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot. Just in that UN scene, all of the Easter eggs dropped and the implications from past episodes and half of which you only know if you're paying attention to the lower third of the screen right. to read what everybody's <laughs> titles are. Right. Which you had to uh, we were pausing it. I was like, "Wait, wait, who's it? Oh, that's Troya." You know, ah, oh my gosh. Like I caught Garth and Troya the first time through and then everything else I'm just like, "Wait, what country are you? You're just oh, I don't know. I've lost it." Rich will tell me later. <laughs> when Kaisen, when Gamora came up, I was like, "That's not DC." And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then I was then I did dig in. I'm like, "Where did that name from?" And, I, and it's the Wildstorm comics. And like I said, I'm pretty sure that they were Image first, and then done by DC. I wasn't. I didn't follow a lot of the Image uh, Wildstorm stuff, so I'm not as much of an expert on that. But I did happen to know. Kaisen Kimura. And I don't think, unless somebody can correct us, I haven't seen anything about any other Wildstorm characters showing up, but we're getting more and more milestone characters coming. Like, I want to see more hardware. Come on. (laughs) Like, you know, like, and I mentioned this in the DC Daily that we did. Like, I'm, I'm over just saying I want, I want more one run of tie in comics for Young Justice. Neil and I are both were saying this. We want a whole, I want a whole imprint. Like, this is, I'd be here for it. This is the, this is the on ramp. That DC Comics has been at, has been wanting every time they reboot their series to something new, they're trying to do it so they can bring new readers in and have have them start at a starting point that they can understand what's happening. This is it. This is this is <laughs> groundbreaking stuff. Like, give us all of it. Give us Young Justice version of Justice League. Give us the Young Justice Legion of Superheroes. Give us everything that you could possibly give us. Like, do a whole imprint. Your your family friendly come in imprint. Do it. Family friendly. In yes. quotations. Right. Maybe cut a few scenes of dead people out. That would be great. <laughs> All right, that's enough of that for me. Okay. <laughs> and with, we'll wrap we'll and wrap with that, that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> and with that and with tirade. That. <laughs> Uh, with that soapbox out of the way we can say it out of the watchtower thanks everyone for spending some time with us if you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series you can find us on twitter at the yj files on facebook at crashing the mode 
on Tumblr at theyjfiles.tumblr.com and on our website, crashingthemode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S. We have to look a lot harder to find those. And if you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.